And do you feel like disru disruption has to be part of it? It can't be a kind of... That's, that's the way it's going to make change. I mean, there are many, many methods you can use to, to make your voice heard and take a stand in this. But disruption is a very symbolic thing. And it's, I think the school strikes are mostly symbolic because, I mean, one day a week you can catch up with. So it's not affecting it that much, but it's mostly like it's symbolic that we say, why should we study for a future that is being taken away from us? Why should we bother to learn facts when facts obviously don't matter in this society? I think it's mostly symbolic, but of course it's, it's, it feels like it's empower, empowering to know that I'm doing something, I'm taking a stand, I'm disrupting, and I'm... I'm It is Friday, April 26, 2019. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Out the Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. In this week's show, Biden, Anita, <laughs> announces through a video that he's running in 2020... Surprise everyone. He's supposed to do it on Wednesday, but there was a She the People event that he definitely did not want to have to deal with. So he waited till Thursday to launch his video. His first stop, of course, was a high-dollar fundraiser at the home of the chief lobbyist of Comcast. You know, the notorious anti-union enemy of net neutrality based right here in the heart of Philly. And Joe Biden, in his launch, he suffers some social media 101 fails. Big time! <laughs> and attempt to clear up his path of obstacles to get his presidency after multiple fails in the past. Biden decided to call Anita Hill a few weeks ago. Hey, Anita! It's Joe. You know, Joe, Joe Biden. He offered his regrets about what he put her through or what she experienced. <laughs> In the 1991 judiciary hearing of then Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. You know, the one who actually had a sexually harassed her in the workplace. That guy. Hey, Anita, listen, here's a gaslight for your troubles. <laughs> but Anita Hill, having none of it, spoke at length to New York Times saying that she sees, quote, Biden is having set the stage for last year's confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who, like Justice Thomas, was elevated to the court despite accusations against him that he had acted inappropriately toward women. Whew, Biden, whatever. But this week, Elizabeth Warren had one hell of a policy week. Uh, she began, this is actually after the show last Friday, I believe, uh, she put out calls for impeachment hearings to begin in the House. And she had a huge launch, I think, on Monday for tuition-free college, which has got the world abuzz. You know, and I have to say, I'm kind of in agreement. There was a writer in The Atlantic, I believe. Uh, I'll have to kind of see if I can bring that article up. But there's a writer in The Atlantic that basically says, look, you got Elizabeth Warren is positioning herself really for the long game. And it's actually kind of a travesty that she's not kind of out kind of in front in the top three right now, given the, the, the depth of her policy. But we'll get in there. This week, as you heard in the intro today, Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist, had joined the ongoing UK pro protest by Extinction Rebellion and other climate activist groups. That stuff's been nuts. It's been awesome. She continues to be a catalyst for more militant action on climate and is literally writing the book and laying it out about how we have to act and how we have to speak to people who refuse to act. As proof of concept, former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and Green Party MP Caroline Lucas are helping launch a handbook about how to become an Extinction Rebellion activist, according to Guardian. The handbook will, quote, feature instructions on everything from organizing roadblocks to dealing with arrest. Freaking awesome. Today's PA focus, Turning Point USA, definitely gearing up for 2020, invited Trump Jr. to speak at Penn State on Wednesday. But little Donnie wasn't the only Trump um, cre cretin? What the hell is that word? Cretin. Cretin. Is that how you spell that, Sean? I don't think so. That looks like some <laughs> sort of Martian freaking mineral. <laughs> some only Trump cretin in Pennsylvania this week. <laughs> Alec Eisenstadt and Holly Otterbein from Politico report 
that Trump sent top campaign operatives to Harrisburg to try to triage the tire fire that's happening at the PA GOP headquarters. Trump sent David Urban, Lou Barletta, and others to meet with party officials. And Sean was sitting there saying, hey, 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 look who's over there. <laughs> Did we have a Scott Wagner sighting in the middle of the fracas? Good thing Sean had been taking pictures of herons. And guess what? In these times, yes, in these times, an employee from In These Times reached out to Sean for a photo of Summer Lee from Swearing In Day. And they will be publishing that as part of a story on DSA candidates who made it to the office for their June edition. I'll be printing the photo for their upcoming magazine. How about that? Congratulations, Sean. And Trisha Nadalny drops a huge story on the Philly Inky Inquirer, a story about Bloomsburg University President Bashar Hanna's long history of misconduct that's been suppressed by several university administrations. It's a story about how university administrations pay off bad actors to help them fail upwards. And yours truly was one of her sources. And big news, Penn Lives gets a paywall. <laughs> <laughs> Suffering succotash. Shields up. Today's last call. A group of undergraduate students at Drake University in Iowa are developing a magnetic shield to defend interplanetary astronauts from the intense cosmic radiation between Earth and Mars. According to Live Science, quote, their Misfit, their magneto-ionization spacecraft shield for interplanetary travel, Misfit, how freaking awesome is that? That design uses a powerful magnetic shield like that of your Earth's magnetosphere, protecting the planet from high-energy particles. Star Trek is just a leap away, folks. And this week, seven, I mean, Forest in Maine is having their seventh anniversary party in Ambler this sunny. Uh, rain or shine, with well, the Sunday, sorry. This Sunday, rain or shine. And this year, they're turning it into a block party. So we have to kind of rush through the podcast today because Sean has to get home quickly on Friday to pretty himself up for the big celebration on this Sunday. <laughs> But this week, also, Weyerbacher sold 55% majority stake in its company to a private investment firm and filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Why? Blame it on pumpkin beer, they say. Sean will be definitely on board with that. This week, uh, two new releases from Free Will. This Saturday, I have Satisfying Chaos. I am definitely getting this. It's an imperial chocolate stout. The beer is decadent with rich notes of chocolate ganache, Willy Wonka's Chocolate River, before it was touched by human hands, and chocolate fondue. That comes in at 14.1 uh, ABV. Boom! That will be available at both locations. And also Bold Bubbles, add to, I guess, to cut the chocolate. It's a brute IPA brewed with dragon fruit and hop with 2019 Pink Boots Society Hop Blend featuring a combination of Sabro Mosaic, Simcoe, Laurel, and Glacier Hops. That's a 6.2 ABV and also both locations. Uh, it's also, I should say, it's, that was brewed by the women of Free Will. Um, as just part one part of the Pink Boots Society Greater Philadelphia Regional Chapter of Collaboration Brew Day, which is pretty cool. Bold bubbles. I want to remind everybody that uh, if you want to support progressive media, you can do it right here. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as five bucks a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash RC Press today and choose your membership level. Not ready to become a member? No problem. Just go to RagingChickenPress.org and click on the big blue donate button on the right sidebar. Best way to invest in keeping media in the movement, however, become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Go to Patreon.com slash RC Press today. Sean, man, happy uh, Forest in Maine weekend, I guess. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I know it's a very I'm important day in, in your uh, um, um, you know beer evolution. Yes, I've been going there since they opened seven years ago. There you go. So you're kind of like a founder almost. Yeah, like a founder much. barfly. Like customer <laughs> one. <laughs> customer one. <laughs> He's like, I was sitting outside the place before I was open for weeks, man. <laughs> they were like, they even called the cops on me a couple times. <laughs> but I just played frisbee with the guys a little bit and everything was cool. <laughs> yeah, so that sounds pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but before that, before we can get to Forest of Maine, uh, we have to go through the Biden. <laughs> we got some news this week. <laughs> Holy moly, did we get some news. Good old Man. Joe Biden is launched his presidential campaign. Where should we even start? 
<laughs> I don't know. Like, I was thinking about this, like, earlier. Like, we had a really good conversation uh, a couple weeks ago after the podcast when we did, like, that Thursday night podcast. Yeah. About, like, Biden and how he just, like, you know, he just con- – he has a knack for just continually stepping in it. Like, and not just, like, stepping in it, but, like, just willfully, like, just jumping in the pile of shit that's, like, right in front of him. Like, and, like, I mean – yeah, uh, here we go. Uh, it's, it's, well, it was it's like starting. I mean, I mean, it, like uh, I'm actually like surprised. I can't believe that he is actually running, especially after the Me Too jokes that he made about consent and touch yeah. in, front, in front of electricians a few weeks ago. Like I am. I mean, he just doesn't have any self awareness. He doesn't have any like uh, he like he doesn't know what's gonna. Like, he doesn't know what's coming when everyone else knows what's coming. Like, I mean, the knives are coming, going to coming out from all angles on Biden just to get him out of the race. <clears throat> Absolutely. You know what's what's fascinating to me. I, I, mean, I mean, we got we had a bunch of things to talk about with Biden, right? So, I mean, yes, I think that's the perfect context for that. So, like, after you get these um, people coming forward saying, "Look, like, he was kind of behaving inappropriately and made made them feel really uncomfortable." There were there were no accusations that he was kind of like like you know like w- was like sexual assault or anything like this it was all about discomfort and being too handsy and making women feel uncomfortable right um and uh creating a a bad environment all that kind of stuff and his response to that was like you know he releases a video basically you know does the classic move right of guys that don't want to take responsibility for stuff is like i feel i'm sorry that they felt that way <laughs> that kind of that's that logic right he's like i'm sorry that happened to you as if like he's removed from and he was like observed it from like you know like like no well that's exactly the point right so what he did there was you know he comes out does it and he gives this kind of like you know this this video response like he can't even deal with it publicly this was this video response that's kind of and then two days later or whatever he goes out and meets with the electricians and kind of makes jokes about it, like make light of it, you know, to much of the delight of the the the. This, and this is where like, guys thought he was going to announce his run for president. See, like people were actually expecting that to happen there out of nowhere, like that he was running for president. Yeah, and I think he was pretty pissed that he couldn't do it. I think he was pissed that he couldn't do it um, <clears throat> for that. And the fact that he did his he did, he did his launch by video this time, uh, I think it's like okay, we're going to make sure we're as far away from the press as possible. Right, because they know exactly what was what was going to happen. But th- did you watch his video? Yes, I did. <laughs> so, I, no, seriously, I saw this, and I had a sinking feeling in my in my soul when I watched his video. I thought it was very negative. It was very like brow. I I don't know. Like it 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 felt like it it was this like rebranded nationalism. Well, look, that yeah. like that like our nationalism is better than like your nationalism. Look, which I, was, like 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 I feel like, and I feel like that's just dangerous. Like I, I like I watched it and I felt like, I mean, I don't know if like hitting on Charlottesville the way he did is the correct thing to do. Like very first thing, like you know what I mean. Well, it was a, it was I mean, a little bit like of an the, awkward an awkward shift in terms of the way he was doing. But look, what, what, what I mean, because it was just like boom. Like I mean, I don't know. Like if I wanted to, like, like people were calling this like Church, uh, uh, Churchill, Winston Churchill, like Churchillian. Who was like, calling like, that? Who who was like, a couple that? of people? I like a consultant friend of mine on Facebook. Are you fucking right kidding? Here. Excuse me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Churchill. <laughs> Yes, you know, what this was. I'm telling you, if this, if that's Churchill, you know what? It, it's it's a it's a like, it's such a, a kind of a romanticized version of Churchill. Of Churchill, Churchill was a war hawking fucking prick, and right. the, just what, like, and, and was horrible concert, like a horrible like social person. Like, right. But what? Here's the deal. Here's the deal for me. This is what gave me the sinking feeling. What gave me the sinking feeling was that so much of what that video was about was about feeling good about trying to kind of pull on the strings of nostalgia that a particular segment of this population, right, particular older folks, right, um, w- see as those, you know, things that are America in their I- kind of ideals, not in their everyday lives, but in their ideals. And it's attempting to run a campaign, right, on ideas divorced from reality, right? And and so what 
and I frankly, and we we're talking a little about this before the show today. Not this exactly, but the the fact is that we know that a lot of people that are paying attention to politics right now are people who are normally paying a lot of attention to politics. So, but when we get to the debates. And when we get to the, the ads is I see Biden is going to be kind of flooding the airways with all this feel good stuff that's going to play on nostalgia. And I think that is going to play really well with the big money and the Wall Street types that want to basically keep the game going. And, you know, you know what, like, I felt like with this was and where, where I think this is going to fail. Like, I, I think it's pretty ap- apparent that Obama raised, lifted a lot of people's a lot of other people's boats like you know, he made Biden look better. He made Clinton look better, like just because of the Obama brand. And I, I mean, Clinton like ran a horrible campaign and lost. I mean, Biden. People are trying to tell Biden not to run, and he's running anyway. Well, and, and like, I don't feel like I mean, like these people aren't Obama. Like you know what I mean? Like they're not. Like they 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 are. They have the same policies. They're like moderate conservative Democrats, in that respect. But like. <clears throat> they, they don't have like the speaking skills or the oratory skills that Obama has, or like the the charisma. And I just feel like Biden's going to come off as like an uh, uh, an insincere prick. Well, but okay, so here's the thing. So here's it's, it's here, but like this that. is what I think. This is what I think we got coming right. And I, I made a post about this to Facebook this week. And um, is I think that um, that what we're gonna we're, it's gonna intensify the fight in the Democratic Party. And it's gonna it's gonna I mean, we're, it's we're, gonna we're, intensify we're, it's gonna intensify the generational we're, 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 the generational fight within the party right now because I think there's a lot of people that are in the kind of that the centrist wing of the the, the fading DLC and the people that have authority within the Democratic Party that are going to start to re- they're already doing it rally behind rally behind Biden and they're going to use the excuse that oh Biden could defeat Trump and so all that groundwork that was laid about Trump bad man Trump bad man Trump bad man let's forget about policy let's just think about about Tony and, and Trump, right bad man. Trump bad man. Yeah, and then that's exactly and people are going to that, that I think I think I I'm concerned that there's a good chunk of people um that will go. Now, the good thing is is that we've got a we've got a, an organized left like we didn't like um during Obama or during even kind of the Hillary Clinton campaign. Yeah. Uh, we had an organizing left during the uh the Clinton Sanders uh primary, right? But now we have an organized left. So and that's like, important. So Summer Lee wrote this on Facebook yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had a screen capture of it, and this is just great. Uh, I haven't spoken much about the presidential election. I'm much more worried about locals right now. And I think it's prudent to take time, uh, do your research, and watch as these campaigns play out. They're very revealing. That said, I do not... I do think it's clear uh, we're at, that we're at a crossroads and an intense generational struggle between maintaining or returning to the way old... the old ways, status, status quo, and forging a new, bolder future that in many ways is inevitable. Joe Biden, and not just Joe, but definitely Joe, and his fourth campaign in the physical embodiment of going backwards. There is no future or vision there, only nostalgia. And nostalgia definitely ain't equitable. Uh, Whatever you're looking for, surely this ain't it, hashtag. Yeah, and I'm hoping that rug gets pulled out pretty quickly. Um, but I really do look, I mean, the fact that he, that his first stop was to go to, to kind of like, um, you know, the chief lobbyist of Comcast, right? And look, if you want, if you want to go, go nitpicky, technically the guy's house that he went to, he's not a registered lobbyist. He's the only the guy who coordinates all of Comcast lobbyists, right? Because he's no longer registered as a lobbyist. He's the one who's managing all the lobbyists. So, I mean, I, I got into this weird conversation with somebody about the other day about this. So I'm just going to lay that out there. Yes, I know, right? The guy is not a registered lobbyist. But the whole point of it is that he's the guy who coordinates Comcast's entire lobbying campaign. So give me a freaking break that's his first stop and with with a um, email out to donors right earlier that week basically what he said the intercept has reported on this excellent um um very good um basically saying look um biden's freaking out he said listen what we got to do and there's a reason why he waited for his campaign um to after um April 15th to make the announcement because he knew that fundraising was going to be an issue, especially in the wake of Bernie Sanders and a lot of small, small dollar donors. So he immediately made um, pitches to top dollar donors, right, to max out their contributions, because in his words, those first 24 hours are going to be super important. Right. So that all he wants to see is the dollar money or, 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 or the ding, dollar. Ding, 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 yeah, that's ding, it. That's ding, it. Ding, ding, ding. And he like, wants to post that. Right. And he wants to just roll in as much fucking money as possible from. Uh, these max donors, right? And so let's let's see now. Let's. I and also, talk, we should also talk about like Comcast. Yeah, 
what Comcast is involved in in Philadelphia, they brought a lawsuit for going against the fair pay, for fair fair work weeks. You know, they 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 they've threatened to sue the, like the city over um over issues like actual issues that unions fought for. Yep. And this is who Joe Biden runs to. Yeah, I mean Comcast is one of the notorious anti-union like companies. I mean they're they're I mean everybody knows that, right? And if you're kind of involved with kind of labor issues whatsoever, you know that. I think it's with the Fair Work Week. I'm not sure. Well, let me like I want to I don't want to there's a story, well, I want to talk about the Anita Hill stuff in just a second. Um, but in the story about um, Anita Hill, um, th- this is I want to kind of just underscore what my concern is here. Um, and if anybody feels that there is any reason to, like, let up on the Democratic Party and not continue the pressure, um, this should be your kind of like, you know, confirmation that, nope, we've got to push hard, push hard. And this is going to be a fight. So in this story about the New York Times, right, after the inter- they interview um, uh, Anita Hill and all this stuff, um, they turn to different um, Democratic operatives, right, um, yeah. and to ask about their comments. And I'm just going to read a little bit of this so you can get a sense of what's going on. So here's his quote. Um, Within, uh, with Mr. Biden almost an instant front runner in a very crowded Democratic field, the subject of Anita Hill is a delicate one among the Democrats, even those who believe Mr. Biden bungled the hearings. Many former Judiciary Committee aides and other people who participated did not want to talk on the record because they feared that scrutiny of Mr. Biden's past conduct would undermine the campaign of the candidate some think be best positioned to defeat President Trump, whose treatment of women is a huge issue for Democrats. Quote, it's definitely going to come up, unquote, Representative Jan uh, Schakowsky, Democrat of Illinois, said in an interview this week. I don't know how exactly he's going to handle it, but there will be scrutiny of the Anita Hill issue, which I think resonates in a different way today. So he has to be able to respond to it in a context now of the Me Too movement, unquote. Representative Jamie Raskin, Democrat of Maryland, was even more pointed. Biden's chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee during the Thomas nomination reflected his sense of institutionalism a lot more than any sense of feminism. None of this would be disqualifying, but it does does not stand up well to the feminist sensibilities of the Me Too era. <laughs> Mrs. Boxer... Right after after during the hearings, a Biden eventually appointed um, um, uh, what's her face, Diane Feinstein, um, to the hearing after she was elected, and they talked to Barbara Boxer about it. And said Mrs. Boxer and others credit Mr. Biden for quickly realizing that his all male panel was ill equipped to fairly evaluate such issues as sexual harassment, and for bringing Senator Diane Feinstein, Democrat of California, onto the panel as soon as she was elected to the Senate in 1992. So. Okay, what's the takeaway here? The takeaway here is, one, there's a couple of people that are willing to speak on the record, but only in general terms. And there's a whole lot of people, if you read the rest of this article, too, as well, that are not willing to go on the record or talk about it extensively because they're worried about upsetting his campaign. So that should be a signal right there. So that the minute we say that we can, that we're being told that these folks do not want to disqualify him, they do not want to upset him, they're basically saying that we want to sweep all this stuff under the rug. And you know what? I don't think we're in a context where that's going to happen. Um, so the de- you have Democratic consultants and establishment folks, right, are attempting to kind of move in this direction of kind of like, okay, we're, we're going to get behind Bi- Biden by not talking about the bad stuff and only about the good stuff, which is essentially what we saw in his campaign launch video. So win-win, uh, win, man, win-win. Speaking about that campaign launch video. Yeah. Whoa. Um, Heather Heyer's mom went on news this morning. This is what I was. Row. This is what I was talking about before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you read her quotes? Yeah. Go ahead. But well, go ahead. D- tell people about it. Okay. Heather Heyer. I mean, she's a woman who was killed in Charlottesville. Woman that was killed in Charlottesville. Um, so Susan Bro goes on the news, I guess, uh, this morning, and pretty much uh, explained that uh, Joe Biden reached out for her for the first time yesterday after the ad dropped. Uh, so this is what the slot Jezebel um, said. Um, uh, the mother of Heather Heyer had no idea her daughter's death would be part of Joe Biden's presidential campaign launch ad. Uh, Susan Bro told C- CNN on Friday that uh, Biden had only called her Thursday evening, nearly 12 hours after the ad dropped. That was the first time I had ever spoken to Joe Biden or anybody related to his camp to his office. Uh, Bro says uh, the two discussed uh, grief as Biden lost his wife. 
uh, daughter and son and discussed the importance of uh, a forming a foundation to survive. I think he said something about, quote, I would have reached out sooner, but I wasn't sure how you'd feel, uh, bro said. And I commented, yes, I noticed uh, you didn't mention, uh, I noticed you didn't mention her name uh, because you, you didn't contact me. So we sort of acknowledged that much. End quote. <clears throat> It's like, you know, I, I mean, he's just, he, again, like, he's just really fucking bad at this. Well, no, but what do you, like, I, like, this is like, the kind like, of, like, like, if he was sincere about using Charlottesville and that message about, like, you know, and, like, you know, about Heather Heyer and stuff like that, I mean, like, yes, if that's good, like, speak to the family first. You think? I mean, I'm not, like, speak to the family, like, hey, guess what we're doing tomorrow. Like, actually sit down with the family. And make this like a, a months long process. It's bad. It's bad. And I think, look, this in my mind, the the pattern here is the same thing that we've been discussing. Like, this is like this is the, the little bit of slimy, creepy Uncle Joe stuff, right? On the one hand, you get this kind of weird touchiness, right? This kind of like you know, which is whatever you want to call it. Well, whatever you want to call it, right? I just inappropriate, wrong, right? Weird, creepy. But then you also get this, this certain kind of like like political sliminess that we saw when you had kind of like, you know, what he's trying to deal with his race question, right? Who did he invite for a special meeting, Sean? Do you recall? Who did he... Wait, wait, what's that? Stacey Abrams? Stacey Abrams. Jeez, that's right, right? For a special meeting to basically say... BP pick right exactly to try to kind of deal with his race issue by using another woman right then you have here you know we find out his campaign had reached out to anita hill a couple weeks ago to try to inoculate his campaign right against what he knew was going to be kind of major kind of problems and even anita hill says we'll talk about this in a second anita hill is like you know i have nothing of it this was he didn't even freaking apologize right and then now we get this the same thing with heather higher right that it's like, oh, it's like afterwards, all, you almost get the sense this consultant kind of said after the fact, like, oh, that was really good, Joe. That was really good. I was like, oh, by the way, did you actually talk to the, to the mom? Oh, shit, we should call her. Right? We should call her because we don't call her shit. That's going to come back in our faces. We better go contact it. That's what this feels like to me. And because, like, otherwise, like, wh where the hell is it? You know, where the hell was, was he in the rest of the process? So, whatever. It's, uh, <clears throat> it is what it is. And then, like, and then right after that, first thing he does is go to a fundraiser with the Comcast executives. And the second thing, did you see about his second fundraiser? No, what was it? <clears throat> it's going to be out in Los Angeles with Hollywood and Google and other tech executives. This shit, look, this shit scares me. Because, look, and, look, I, look, I, I mean, led, like, like we are relitigating 2016 at this point. Well, it's it's worse than that, Sean. It's worse I mean, than like, that. It's I mean, worse like, than that because we cannot afford more of the same. We're yeah, at I a mean, point. Look, and this is why I play I, Gre 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 Greta Thunberg like as the, as the lead up. She's her voice kind of was there on the intro in here because I mean you know everyone knows that. But listen to this podcast. You know what I'm saying. Look, we've got we've got 11 years. This is the last chance. We can't fuck this. This up. is it. Right, we do not have time for some freaking win-win kind of like like corporate niceties, like to be like enacted by someone like like Biden. Right, that whole and centrist who wing. Twenty sixteen are trying to fuck up twenty twenty. Totally, we do not have the and we time. We really can't afford it. We cannot afford it. I mean, as as like a freaking species, people, right? But at the very least, I mean, you, I mean, God, it's like we have an opportunity here. That is that we have not had in my lifetime to actually address fundamental, ongoing, and worsening crises in our society. We're talking about inequality. We're talking about the climate crisis. We're talking about historic legacy racism. Right. We're talking about deeply ingrained sex. This is all on the table right now, and we have an opportunity to leap past the crap of the way things have been done and into a new future. And the people who are clutching to their, uh, their fucking gated communities are like throwing Joe Biden out there, the worst possible candidate to do this. Well, let, let, well, let me tell you, this I, is, this is I, like, this is like, you know, the arguments that I have, I, I have had over the years, right. And people, certain groups of us have had, even within like our own union, for example, right. There's that the push where either you need to go to the next level, 
right? You need to organize as a militant union in order to be able to defend the very thing that you claim to love, higher education, in my case, right? But then the push is always like, no, if we get we get the right person, right, at the head of things who can negotiate with the right person on the other side, that those people will eventually come to some mutual agreement and things that will be okay. We've learned, if we have not learned that that model is ineffective and does not work, the only thing it can do is protect the people who already have the privilege and give a few crumbs to the rest of the rest the rest of the crew. That can no longer work, not even at a functional society's like like society functional level. And it certainly cannot work when we're talking about the future of the planet and climate change. So Joe Biden, that's what scares the crap me about someone like Joe Biden, because I hear, you know, again, I hear people talk about, oh, I love Joe Biden. And these are people who not do not know politics really well, do not focus a lot on policy, but he makes them feel good and reminds them of a way that things used to be. And that concerns me. So all the more power to those folks on the ground who are doing this organizing because we've got it. We've got to move forward. We have to. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about about the about the Anita Hill stuff, right? Because you know this was the other thing that just that that, that kind of just like blew my mind, right? That he kind of reached out to her and kind of did it in the creepiest way possible. I didn't read the Anita Hill story <clears throat> yet. I'm gonna have to when I get home. <laughs> but like, I did I did see like the one quote uh, from a story last year or a couple summers ago where Anita Hill was like, oh, we always have a running joke in the house. Uh, whenever the door ring, doorbell rings or the phone rings, we ask, is that Joe finally calling to come coming over to apologize? <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, like, that's, she is a, I mean, she has every right to just be like, not bitter over that. Like, I mean, I think bitter is a strong word for this situation, but like every, she has every right to be like, no, fuck you. I'm not accepting your apology. Like, uh, well, here's here's the way she said about it. Right. So basically the campaign now, the, the Biden's campaign is the one who disclosed that the call took place. Right. And and the vote and his his camp, the Biden people told reporters. Said, oh, yeah. yeah. He, Joe Biden called and said he was sorry. No, no, no. He, even his camp, even his people told the media that what he did is he called Mrs. Hill to express his regret for what she endured. OK. And now. Anita Hill is notorious for not wanting to talk to reporters, right? She was a reluctant witness to begin with, um, with the Clarence Thomas hearings, right? After she had been sexually assaulted by him, sexually harassed by him. But so this is, this is how the times lay this out. Let's just spend a little time with this. So in a lengthy telephone interview on Wednesday, she declined to characterize Mr. Biden's words to her as an apology and said she was not convinced that he has taken full responsibility for his conduct at the hearings or for the harm he caused other victims of sexual harassment and gender violence. She said she views Mr. Biden as having, quote, set the stage for last year's confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who, like Justice Thomas, was elevated to the court despite accusations against him that he had acted inappropriately toward women. And she added, she was troubled by the recent accounts of women who say that Mr. Biden touched them in ways that made them feel uncomfortable. Quote, I cannot be satisfied by simply saying, I'm sorry for what happened to you, said Mrs. Hill, now a professor of social policy and law and women's studies at Brandeis University. Quote, I will be satisfied when I know there is real change and real accountability and real purpose. But she added, she cannot support Mr. Biden for president until he has taken full responsibility for his conduct, including his failure to call as corroborating witnesses other women who were willing to testify before the Judiciary Committee. By leaving them out, she said, he created a he said, she said situation that did not have to exist. The focus on apology to me is one thing, Mrs. Hill said, but he needs to give an apology to the other women and to the American public because we know how deeply disappointed Americans around the country were about what they saw. And not just women. There are women and men now who have been who have just recently really lost confidence in our government to respond to the problem of gender violence. So she's pulling no punches. She's saying that call may have been cordial, was an apology, and he doesn't even kind of even address the the extent to which his uh, to his participation or his leadership on that committee set the stage for like a, a like a step backwards in addressing yeah. gender violence. There you go. 
crazy, man. I know. I think that's going to be coming. I, I, I honestly do not see Biden lasting through the primaries. I don't see him making it to the convention. Um, I think he's going to be like, I, I, people are going to realize real quickly who he is. And right now what they're thinking is uh, Joe Biden, the nostalgia Joe Biden, like Uncle Joe. You know, the, the, the onion meme worthy Joe Biden that we've gotten for like 10 years. When like, that's like not who he is. <laughs> and no, I, I think like once his record comes up and Nita Hill, his stuff with the bankers, like you saw what Elizabeth Warren said last night. No, what'd she say? She said, uh, Joe Biden, yeah, oh, it's oh. fact. <laughs> fact, he, he's on the side of the credit card companies. Yep. that That's part of public record, yep. pretty much. Like, I mean, I, I'll, uh, let me pull up the tweet right now. I mean, like, here we go. Warren asked by a reporter and Wall, uh, Warren asked about Biden uh, and Wall Street says their disagreement over bankruptcy legislation is a matter of public record. Uh, she puts it bluntly. Joe Biden was on the side of credit card companies. Yeah. And let's 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 remember that uh, he's been a senator for Delaware. Right. Which is basically a tax haven. Yeah. Right. It's a way that different states and companies avoid paying taxes. And Delaware has been at the forefront of that. That's why a lot of credit card companies are based in that backyard. They're based in Wilmington yeah. around the area. There you go. And, you know, I don't know. And, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, he's I'm telling you is that he's not going to be able, given his reaction, his response and his like poking fun at the kind of like, you know, I got permission to touch them at that at that event with the electricians. He's going to he's not going to be able to contain himself. Th that right there for me, if I'm a consultant on this, on any of these campaigns, that, that right there is just that, that like is social media fodder. Yep. Like, like just, just run advertising on TV commercials and social media videos. Yep. Like that's it. Like that, that, that that's just like, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> like, yep. I mean, yeah, you just provided someone with, I mean, and, and it'll be negligence if no one uses that on him in the primary. Yep. Because if he gets through the primary, then like Trump will use that. Yep. Yep. And it's, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, but I so, mean, so since you brought up Warren, let's talk a little bit about Warren's or Warren's campaign. Um, there's been some really good um, kind of reporting on her um, this, this past, past couple of weeks. And, you know, what the thing is, is that, you know, she's just released, um, you know, one, she called for impeachment. And um, frankly, I thought that was one of the strongest positions that she has come out from before. I think that that was in her lane. Like, I don't know if you saw her talk about that. I mean, she, she released something about it, like on a medium, she published it. Um, she was on, um, I don't know, Chris Maddow. Hayes, Maddow, was it Maddow? When she was talking and yeah, it was Maddow. Right. And she basically just basically, you know, was asked point blank about it. And she's like, look, I don't know. I read the stuff. And I had to sit there and you pretty quickly realize that this goes well beyond politics, that you have a constitutional duty at this point. And you have to decide basically what she was saying. Basically, you have to decide, are you going to act as a politician or are you going to act as someone who's protecting a particular a particular constitutional democracy? And she's like, you know, once you start, once you make that shift, I don't think there's a question about, uh, you know, we should have these hearings. And. Maddow put push back on her and as other people have pushed back on her and basically are saying, yeah, but you know, um, uh, Cuomo, like uh, Chris Cuomo basically what said this on the, the town hall too as well. So, you know, there's Democrats or no, I guess it was Anderson Cooper. You know, Democrats are saying that, you know, if you do the impeachment, that could negatively affect, uh, 2020. And her response is like, I don't know what to tell you, <laughs> you know, basically I don't know what to tell you is like, you can play politics with this, but you, we have been, we had our elections manipulated by a foreign actor and we have a president and a campaign, right? That was more than happy to welcome the hope or, or the help, right? And encouraging it. So I don't know what else you need basically. And then when you look at the obstruction stuff, right? I don't, I mean, how do you not see that these are grounds at the very least, like for, for hearings on impeachment? Right. I mean, and, you know, frankly, I don't see how you get around that. And I think the Democrats, the more that the Democrats are, are going to try to kind of get around that and not address this question. We talked about this actually on the show last week, week before. Um, 
it, the more it's going to damage the Democratic Party. And you saw the other candidates for president, right, starting to have to really dance around that issue, right, because they didn't want to do it, because they know the Democratic Party leadership is not kind of on board with uh, kind of calling for impeachment. But increasingly, um, you have people stepping up and getting on, for example, Rashid oh, Harris. Yeah, well, up this week. well uh, sort of stepped up this week. I think Castro, right? Did he? Yep. And you had, um, and you had, uh, um, you know, people, more people signing on. AOC was kind of out and vocal around it, signing on with Rashida Tlaib's um, calling calls for um, kind of impeachment hearings. Um, this is going to be important, and you know, at the very least, kind of moving forward. And I'm really hoping. I have to say, the more and more I look at Elizabeth Warren's campaign, the more I, I, I am waiting for that moment where that she is going to kind of break out and I, like again i was looking for this one article and i just couldn't i couldn't come up with it uh, right off the bat but there was a really good analysis of some of what she's doing um is that she is laying out all the policies she's going in the exact opposite direction that you see a lot of the other democratic party candidates um with the exception of bernie sanders but bernie sanders d- certainly does not have as flushed out as plans as, as elizabeth warren does um you know if i had to talk politically i'd say you know i i lean more towards some of the, the you know the approach that Sanders has taken, but the more I'm looking at Warren's stuff, um, the more important it's going to be that um, her, it was a new Republic. I found it. Uh, <laughs> the more it's going to be important, it's going to be for her um, to be out in front and center. And so this piece was from Bob Moser. This is it. Bob Moser in the new Republic um, says that the long distance runner of the 2020 race. So I think we really need to keep an eye on, on kind of the policies that she's putting out because these policies have an opportunity to define the debate in the, um, in the democratic, pri- in the democratic primary. So, you know, again, no matter where you sit in terms of like, you know, which candidate you're supporting, uh, if you're a progressive, um, you got to be hope you got to be pushing to kind of make sure that Elizabeth Warren is kind of out in front of this, Um, because, you know, if it came down to like a um, like three candidates with Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, um, and then, you know, choose your other your your number four, um, that is a good place to be. I think uh, moving to the end of the primary. So, and I also enjoy that she put out her uh, her debt free college, and um, you know she wants to eliminate student debt. Yes, St- cancel student debt this week. I mean, like, uh, it's amazing how uh, you get the other Democrats, like Mayor Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, and all these people who like. I mean, like they they show you the alternatives with the alternative. The alternative is the centrist status quo of the Democratic Party. Yep, of like. Yeah, let's push for tax credits instead of like eliminating student debt. Yep. I mean, I thought, and then someone was like, "Well, like, I think you know we should be having tax credits on this. That should be part of the conversation." Like, no, it's not part of the question. Like, tax credits is just a like it's just a policy idea from a morally debased part of the Democratic Party. That's right. That is just that is losing power. Well, yeah, tax credits and the other part of it that was like, like you, you see where where people stand tax on this stuff. We need to be able credit. to like Buttigieg was like this too as well. Buttigieg like we need to be able to refinance our student loan debt. Like that no, was and the Klobuchar big. Klobuchar said that too. Yeah, and Klobuchar was same thing. They're out there. We people, re, people refinance their yachts. You exactly. Should be able to refinance your student loan. Exactly. And you know the fact you know fact is and you know it should be. It I should, can't believe they tweeted that. Well, no, no, they, but they believe that. Yeah, I they know. think that's a winning message. And so, I mean, I think that unlike every other policy debate that's been out there so far, I thought we got to see the sharp differences between positions around the uh, around the uh, tuition free college um, than at any other time. And tuition free college is an idea that is being pushed on the state level by party by state Democrats too across well, the country. That's right. And I didn't realize I mean, this, but it's almost 20 states now. Right. Um, offer. So it's becoming a, a it's becoming a very popular position within the Democratic Party, and it's just like I mean, like, and this is where like people like Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg, Jill Lebrand, and Biden are just all failures. Like they 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 represent that wing of the party where it's like, no, actually, we have to keep the billionaire part, the donor base, the billionaire donors happy. Yeah, let's get back to that idea about like billionaires investing directly in students' future, where the students are kind of like stocks. Let's get back to that idea, <laughs> right? Let's get, you know, that's seriously, that's the kind of, that's what they see as kind of an exciting new idea is like treating people like stocks that people invest in, right? You know, like whatever entrepreneurs or capital. But, but so this is, this is really important. The thing that I should say about what was important about Warren's piece um, and more so than, than any other proposal I've seen so far is that she exactly what you pointed out is that not only is she talking about tuition free college, but she's also talking about getting rid of and buying out the debt, right? Um, of it'll, it'll work out to be about ninety five percent 
right, of kind of the student loan debt will be wiped out as part of this. And it's all on a kind of because of a 2% tax on the top income earners. Right? Like the top, top income earners. Top, like the top income earners. Exactly. And as she said in her town hall on Monday, is that not only with that 2% tax, not only will you be able to do um, tuition-free college and wipe out student loan debt, but you're also going to be able to get universal pre-K and universal child care, right? And have money left over, right? And that's, that's just that one. So, I mean, I'm telling you, Warren, if like, is that she is not, she is not the most, I would say, dynamic politician in terms of, say, like um, the kind of political charisma in some ways until she gets going on policy stuff. And we we got to we got to pay attention to the policy stuff at the very least. Right. Um, this has got to got to be the, the line in which defines the debates. So it's pretty good. Uh, last thing I want to talk about a little bit is uh, is is uh, Greta Thunberg. Right, she's the 16 year old Swedish act climate activist. Uh, she was uh, she did basically a train tour. Um, she's been refusing to fly right in between places as a part of kind of because of the climate impact of um, of uh, planes, and so been doing a train trip through Europe. Um, has stopped at the EU um, in Brussels, um, gave speeches there. She's been giving speeches um, in the UK. Um, she was brought into uh, with a group of uh, MPs um, in in Parliament in the UK. She joined uh, Extinction Rebelling activists uh, who have been occupying. Um, uh, where 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 are the, the circus circus? What's that place? Oh, I can't. I'm just drawing a blank right now. Uh, it'll come back to me at some point, but um, who've been basically occupying squares in um, in um, um, in in London, um, shutting things down, and basically saying that we have to disrupt um, business as usual because people are not paying attention. And her speech before the uh, the MPs was just was once again absolutely brilliant. Um, but more important um, than that um, is the fact that she is basically modeling um, how you speak to these people. How you speak to them and you basically say, I don't care about all your crap. I'm not going to come up with like, you know, solutions for you that you can shoot down. That's your job. But we don't have any more time. And so we are just going to shut stuff down, basically. So um, fam- amazing. And the fact that now you have the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and Green Party MP, uh, Caroline Lucas, actually getting together to kind of rush uh, a handbook, a publication of a handbook that will help other people establish extinction rebellion um, activist groups. Right, um, looking at tactics, um, looking at strategies, um, everything roadblocks dealing with re- address, uh, arrests and so on. I really think that is the only model forward, because you know right now we have an opportunity in this country, right, with the Green New Deal, to actually address this stuff. Um, uh, like I said at the very beginning of the show, uh, or comprehensively across the board from inequality to, um, um, to to climate change and to stave off catastrophe. And um, frankly, people aren't moving quickly enough. So uh, as we lead up to the 2020, once again, we have an amazing opportunity here to put all the pressure on this issue and demand this from our candidates. So um, kudos to Greta Thunberg once again. Um, just absolutely an amazing individual. So... Oh, boy, Sean. I think we need to take a break. What do you say? Sounds like a good idea. All right. Well, hey, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, I want to remind you, uh, I should first mention this up the top of the front, but please uh, tune in to the Rick Smith Show when you get a chance. We're going to hear from Rick in just a second. Tune in the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Or kind of download his podcast, his, uh, his daily podcast, uh, wherever you may get your podcast. And uh, just as a way of playing us out... Uh, this is a song that I'm just going to dedicate um, to uh, Joe Biden and, uh, and his campaign. Um, this is brought to you by me and my daughter. We are the union. We are the union. The mighty, mighty union. Mighty, mighty union. Where Everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. People want to know. People want to know. Who we are So we tell them So we tell them We are the union We are the union The mighty, mighty union I'm Rick Smith And this is Labor History in Two 
1948, gold was discovered at John Souter's Mill in California. As word spread, fortune seekers from all across the United States and across the world flocked to California in what became known as the Gold Rush. This included thousands from China. Many of the Chinese miners planned to return home with the gold they mined. As the easily accessible gold became more and more scarce due to the rush, resentment grew against foreign miners. In 1850, California passed the Foreign Miners Tax, charging those who came from outside the United States $20 a month. On this day in labor history, the year was 1862. The California legislature passed an act to further limit Chinese miners. The official title was an act to protect free white labor against competition with Chinese coolie labor and to discourage the immigration of the Chinese into the state of California. The word coolie referred to unskilled laborers from China and the Indian subcontinent. It was also often used as a derogatory term for Chinese people. The act implemented new taxes and licensing requirements on Chinese miners. The steep taxes led many Chinese to leave miners. Nearly 12,000 Chinese workers found employment with the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. They performed extremely dangerous work laying the track through the Rocky Mountains. Yet, when the railroad project was completed, the Chinese workers were excluded from the celebrations. They were also not allowed to ride on the trains that crossed the continent for the first time. Anti-Chinese racism continued to grow. Twenty years after the passage of the California law, the federal government passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. This law prohibited the immigration of Chinese labor. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryintube.com. Welcome back to Raging Chickens Out the Coop Podcast and our PA Focus. Sean, it was a busy week in Harrisburg this week. Yes, it was. What was going on? Um, so, uh... I don't know if we need breaking news on this, but uh, did it, did it, did it, did it. <laughs> I got to get my breaking news drop. So the uh, the Pennsylvania GOP is a burning tire fire right now, <laughs> <laughs> and has been one for a couple of years. Yeah, well, um, I I, I, th- I would like to think that uh, Scott Wagner had uh, had had a role in that too. <laughs> well, and um, now like Trump's campaign people are uh, getting pretty. Uh, upset about this and um, are actually starting to get concerned about the recent losses the GOP has been accumulating, not just with the statewides, but also with uh, the gerrymandering that happened, the redrawing of the maps, the, um, the, uh, the other, the, um, and the two recent losses that they've had out or three losses that they've had out in Western PA, which was supposed to be foolproof for them uh, with Democrats. But, um, you know, with Connor Lamb, Pam Ivino, and Lindsey Williams. Uh, those are three races that the Republican Party should probably have never lost. But um, they end up losing that. And people in Trump, his campaign are, ups- are concerned. And they were in Harrisburg on Wednesday meeting. And they had a secret meeting and, like, pretty much to try to, like, you know, get this tire fire under control. So, so what do you think the prospect that that's going to happen? <laughs> um. They sent David Urban and uh, Lou Barletta up, so you know, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, every time you know, every time you get Lou Barletta's around, uh, you got to feel warm and cozy inside at least. But also, like, I mean, Lou Barletta was one of the first people that helped Trump get in Pennsylvania, and pretty much like is the reason why he won the state. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what Lou Barletta is going to be doing. I thought he'd be taking an administration position. But it seems like he's going to be helping uh, working with the party infrastructure to keep Pennsylvania uh, Republican for 2020. And so why do you think it was important that the, that Dave Urban was in town? Uh, just because he's um, Trump's top campaign person. He's Trump's one of Trump's top people. Uh, he was Arlen Specter's chief of staff, I think, for a while. And then, uh, yeah, like um, – well, and he was I mean, largely credited with like with with uh, the, winning the Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, right? Exactly with the PA strategy for Trump, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. They're bringing the big, uh, bringing the big guns for this one, um, and uh, it seems like that there was a push. There's a push happening kind of around the state um, to really get Trump, uh, you know, getting his name back out there again. 
I guess so. <laughs> well, you had, I mean, like, for example, you had uh, uh, Turning Point USA is kind of like reactivating um, all its cells around, around, the, uh, around the state, invited Trump Jr. to come out and speak at Penn State on Wednesday. Um, so that was, I mean, that was something. And I'll tell you this, too, as well. We didn't talk about this in the intro, but um, they are uh, once again active on Kustan University's campus once again. So the Socialism Sucks pins are starting to appear uh, <laughs> once again. And I've had students come to my office like, yeah, they were out kind of doing these surveys, right? It was really funny to hear some students talk about it now because of how things so much have shifted. I just like, yeah, they're done these surveys. And the first question is like, you know, um, do you like like love capitalism? And, like, you know, they're asking me this question, and I looked at them, I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> and they seem to be a little taken back by that, they were telling me. So, What do you mean? You don't like capitalism? Well, it's just interesting. I mean, this just shows you how the political winds are shifting a little bit. But, nonetheless, Turning Point USA appears to be investing deeply in Pennsylvania, too, as well. Do you think, like, they're, that they're, 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 they're a joke of an organization, or do you think, like, they actually can do some damage? I think they can do some damage. I think because, look, I mean... I mean, they just seem like so much of a propaganda machine. Right. Or like, I mean, I don't see like millennials getting hooked into that propaganda as much as like the boomers, the boomer generation is. Right. But I think that... I think, what- I think like, I don't know. I think I think like their target demo is more keen to see through the bullshit. But but here's 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 where I think that they that they can have an effect and then maybe part of their strategy, right? If you look at the way that these other groups like Turning Point USA have operated in the past, they operate primarily as kind of disruptive, um, like you know, tools. So what happens is that the conversation, right? The you know what can potentially happen, especially in, in the kind of like in that nexus on college campuses, right, where sometimes it feels like you're in this little bubble right, of organization and student, organi- student organizing and student politics can very much get caught up in this, where the enemy, right, or the kind of adversary um, around the kind of the 2020 elections becomes not the, you know, the organizing that's necessary to do out there in the communities, but becomes the, the campus battle with this organization Turning Point USA. And all you need is like four or five different loudmouths, right, who are going to shout off these kind of ideological talking points where it can kind of like focus the attention internally as opposed to the the organizing efforts that can happen. So um, I think there's what the good thing is, is I think there's the the roots of organizing on the left now are deep enough um, following 2016 um, that there's they're they're not going to bite as hard on that, especially with organizations like the PA uh, Student Power Network, which has been like, like well established now kind of across the state of Pennsylvania. I think they're savvy enough to know that Turning Point USA is nothing but a distraction that you need to actually get back to kind of the work of organizing on the ground. So, but that's, that's the one concern about them. That's where I think they can do the damage, uh, especially in kind of under organized areas. Yeah. But, but you had your own little kind of run in, I guess, with, uh, uh, with these secret meetings from what I understand. Yeah. Uh, I ran into Scott Wagner the other day. Scotty, (laughs) he's around. What did he, what did he say to you? I'm in a waste management business. Everybody immediately assumes you're mobbed up. It's a stereotype, and it's offensive. Uh, does that, is it? <laughs> uh, I don't know who he met with, but he was meeting with someone uh, at Sammy's, uh, having lunch right across the street from the uh, Sammy's, right, right, right across the street from the Capitol, and inside his, uh, right next door to his old campaign office. So his old habits are hot, don't die quick. <laughs> So how did that happen? How did you come across that, Sean? <laughs> um, so we were uh, sitting on Roxbury's deck, <laughs> the, the center of Harrisburg, the political universe in Harrisburg is the deck. The deck. <laughs> um, no, we're sitting on Roxbury's deck uh, talking, and uh, Mark Levy from the AP walks by. And, you know, we 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 were on people were on the lookout for people for party officials because it was known that they were meeting in Harrisburg. Uh, for, you know, this was on Wednesday, right after the, that Politico story broke that we were just talking about. And so uh, we happened to uh, turn the corner. Uh, Mark Levy cracked a joke, like, how funny would it be if, uh, you know, they were meeting in Scott Wagner's office and looked up and saw the man in his all right there, <laughs> five feet away from us. <laughs> like, you talk about, like, the timing could not get better than that. Yeah, and you just happen to have your camera on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, I'm just trying to ID the people he was with. I don't know if they were with Trump officials, but, like, Lou Barletta was leaving at the same point. So it could have been. Um, or it could it could just be, like, he's just meeting up with some lawyers. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. 
Good old Scott Wagner trying to get back in the game, trying to reassert his own kind of lack of importance, I guess. It's in 2020. What's that? Auditor General Scott Wagner. Oh, my God. <laughs> my God. There's that guy who just go away. You go away. Give him a row office to make him feel good. We can't do that much damage. Well, I, you know, I think people started started got to start uh, basically uh, filing some lawsuits uh, about his lack of recycling, right? For his uh, thing, but I think that's what they got to start doing. Get him <laughs> occupied with that. What's that? <laughs> nah, just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, and then you've had some good news for this week too. Yes. Uh, and in these times, an uh, employee from their art department uh, reached out to me through Twitter. No, through Reddit, of all places. Uh, uh, to Because um, I had a photo of Summer Lee up in one of the, one of the subreddits, political subreddits, um, from Swearing In Day. And they were asking if I was the original person. I said yes. Uh, they explained that they were from uh, in these times and that they were looking for photos of Summer Lee that weren't from her campaign site. Or mm-hmm. her public site, mm-hmm. so uh, they found this web. They found this, and they're going to run it in their magazine uh, next month. It'll be printed too. Woohoo! I guess the June edition comes out in a few weeks, right? Yeah. Yep. yep and yep. times the June edition comes out in May, right? Yep. Yeah. So, like the June edition, uh, it'll be published in the June edition of Indies Times. Uh, they are doing a story on the on DSA candidates uh, who made it to office this past year. Um, and how the DSA has helped them, and Summer Lee was one of the people that they focused on, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this, this see how this looks. I'm looking forward to it. Very cool, man. I so, am... nice, nice little check in the mail for that, and then uh, getting some copies of this magazine. Do you know which photo I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm very excited. I am very excited to see it. Um, kind of the they put on the front cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty awesome. I mean, it's that type of photo. Like, it's a... <clears throat> so, we will see. We will see indeed. So, uh, I had my own little uh, kind of uh, brush with joy this week. Um, I noticed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, this this morning. <laughs> yeah, just this morning from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, we had um, Trisha Nadalny uh, publish a piece on um, Bloomsburg University President um, uh, Bashar Hanna. Uh, who basically had been accused of sexual harassment. Um, and they're basically saying, like, look, uh, he got forced out of um, multiple um, jobs beforehand. And uh, that is absolutely true. And uh, I was one of the sources for the article, and I'm kind of quoted in the article whatsoever. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an important piece, I think. Um, it's an important piece to check out because um, Bashar Hanna basically um, he has a long history of um, creating hostile work environments, particularly for women. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, he was my dean from, uh, or you know, in I don't know, early two thousands, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Early two thousands, he was my dean, mm-hmm. and um, there had been kind of ongoing kind of you know, rumors, right. About, or people being upset by kind of the way he behaved in particular towards women. Um, and then there were grievances, which were filed eventually, um, about his conduct. Um, and the university basically kind of pushed him away. Right. Well, what was important about Nadalny's uh, piece on this is that she was able to get a lot of the documents that were kind of associated with um, Bashar Hanna kind of getting kicked around. Because after he left um, Kutztown, he got a job at um, in Ithaca College. And I found out about that. I was actually up at a conference at Cornell and uh, there was a woman from Ithaca College there who said, hey, you're from Kutztown University. I was given there, I was given a keynote speak, a, a speech on kind of uh, the, this book and about social organizing and things like this. But um, so she comes up to me and says, oh, so you're from Kutztown University. It's like, well, our, our new dean or vice president or provost, something like this, um, was from Kutztown. I'm like, oh, really? Who? And she told me who. I'm like, are you kidding me? And she's like, no. I said, do you know he was kind of forced out of, of Kutztown, right? Or kind of like, that was what our understanding is. We never knew, though. She was like, no, and didn't, didn't know about it. But we knew that there was something weird. Uh, we heard from some other people. She wouldn't tell me who. Um, but then he was at Ithaca College for a little bit. And then he left there, went to kind of uh, Del Val, right? And then was forced to leave Del Val, right? And then he ends up as the president of the University of uh, Bloomsburg back in the Pashi system. Well, How did you like Pashi? Like, What's that? Was 
Pacini a, a huge advocate for him for getting that position? Who? Pacini. Cheney? Guido. Uh, Guido Pacini. Oh, no, well, I, like I, he might have been. I don't know. I mean, it was really interesting because Guido Pacini was on the board of trustees at Kutztown. You know, he wasn't involved with Pashi up until Corby got into office. Cause, so it just seems like the timing, you know, with Guido Pacini being at Kutztown, Bashar being at Kutztown at that time, and then like having Pacini on speak out as an advocate or described as an advocate and an, and an ally in this article just seemed really interesting. It was. And I think and and I, that streamlined through. Yeah. I mean, and I'm, and I'm, like, like, Bikini was an advocate for um, this guy and it was at Kutztown while he was pushed out. I mean, he certainly knew what was, what happened at Kutztown as like, as like, you know, they were going through the selection process. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm amazed that like that uh, this didn't get reported. Or didn't come up at all with the Pashi well, system. I'm not, not the, amazed. Because Pashi is very incompetent. The administration has shown that over the years, I guess, and it, I don't know. But look, this is not just about incompetence. This, this, this what's important about this. Is, this is about a, about a pro, this is this is the the you know the double standard when it comes to. Um, when it comes to how people are treated and how, how policies are enacted, because what what Nadalny was able to show in this article, right, was that Kutztown University paid well over two hundred thousand dollars, like two hundred eighty thousand dollars, something like this, um, to buy out his contract, right? They gave him paid time off and they bought out his contract, and from all indications, are gave him a positive recommenda- recommendation moving forward. Right now, the, in this story, was who's interviewed the pre, the former president of Kutztown University, Javier Savayos, right, who had to sign off on that. Um, basically, told the story was was the, the story that he's telling is that Bashar Hanna was moved was moved out because there was a conflict with the provost, um, and that was Carlos Alberto Vargas, right? Um, and Vargas was it said there was it was a leadership difference. But in that same story, it says Vargas does not comment, and Vargas tells the tells Nadalne that he doesn't comment because he is not allowed to under the terms of, of that separation agreement. Right. So there's a big question there. Savios, who's in my and from my perspective, has, has done nothing but lie to us, like uh, God, for the entire time he was at Kutztown, which we've been able to basically call him on it and kind of like show him that he had been lying to us when it came to the budgets and everything like this. Um, but he's asking us to take his words. Oh, yeah, it's a leadership difference. But then Vargas is not allowed to speak, and they pay out and they buy out his contract. A uh, similar things happen at Delvale. Right. Um, that he was kind of pushed out. So positive recommendations going forward in the agreement, which Nadalny had some of the agreement in the agreement. It basically says that, well, yes, um, that the university agreed to say that he left on his own accord. Right. And with some sort of positive recommendations. So they get pushed out because all the institution is worried. is want to get this guy out. Right. But what the effect is, is that that same behavior now continues at a new university. And after they have to relearn the whole um, the whole process. The other thing and was, now it's getting out of the media and yes. this time around. Well, what happened at Bloomsburg is like, you know, here's the difference at Bloomsburg where you had an actually an administrator who actually had a, apparently like a moral compass that went outside of its kind of like bottom line kind of like PR world. And right? helped out someone file a grievance. Right. Because basically a woman basically came to him and said, like, look, this is he's treating this is inappropriate. He's doing these things in a hostile work environment. Like you said, you know, she was really upset about the way he was treating her and like Bashar Hanna like hugged her behind a door and kissed her on the head and shit. It was like so freaking creepy, Joe Biden. Um, it was so creepy that, that that what he did, and um, what she went and told this other administrator. That administrator was like, "This is totally wrong. I will say I'm going to go with you and help you file a complaint about this." And then Bashar Hanna fired that administrator, and that administrator filed a lawsuit. That is the only thing that kind of stopped this. And this has been what we have said consistently when it comes to Pasha University presidents and the administrations of the 14 universities and the state system is that the only time that you end up getting to the truth half of it, half of it is like when you actually have to file a lawsuit. And it sucks. It sucks so bad. But the other part of this, like the lesson to be learned, if you read that article um, by Tr- Trisha Nadalny very carefully, um, what you'll see also is that part of the difficulty is is that so many people refuse to come forward and talk about what happened to them, right? So 
and and that was her challenge. I know I, I talked to her extensively throughout this process. And, you know, again, that's always a challenge. If there's somebody who doesn't want to come forward and kind of tell their story, there's only so much you can do, right? The climate of fear is so palpable that people don't that won't come forward and talk about what happened to them, that that is part of what allows this behavior to go on. Right. And the fact is that you have an administration who's basically given the message to everyone underneath them that we are going to take their side. And believe me, the administration took Bashar Hanna's side to the T. Right. Defending that guy to the rest of faculty. Right. And making other faculty feel like they were crazy. Gaslight. Right. And meanwhile, they buy out his freaking contract. And this was happening at the time, by the way, at Kutztown University, where Javier Ceballos Right. Was kind of like like screaming from the rooftops. Crisis, crisis, crisis. We have no money. Budget crisis, budget crisis. Yet they're going to buy out the contract of a bad actor who had created a hostile work environment at Kutztown University and elsewhere and allowed him to do that elsewhere. So I think that is so shameful. I can't even believe you. So like kudos to uh, um, uh, Tradition Adalni and also uh, Susan Snyder. She's the other reporter on it. I kind of spoke primarily to uh, Tradition Nadalny, um, but uh, they did it phenomenal reporting. Um, and so please check it out. The article is called Bloomsburg University President Accused of Sexual Harassment Was Previously Forced Out of Two Jobs. Um, and it was published this morning at 5 a.m. at the Philadelphia Inquirer. So check it out. Something else, man. Did you did you ever have a, a, the pleasure of meeting him? No, I have not. Yeah, the one quote that uh, did not make it into the final thing. Uh, I mean, I did I did get my dark uh, dark comedy quote in there when I found out about uh, Bloomsburg. But uh, when she was asking me to describe um, like his character because she had heard so much about him, and I said, I guess I guess if you fee- if you had to put it, he's like you have a guy who's more like a like a I don't know. Kind of like a academic, quasi academic used car salesman. <laughs> that's how I put it. <laughs> so, but that didn't make it in. Uh, that's okay. But uh, so, yeah, go check that out. Um, the other big news in kind of Pennsylvania, um, Pennsylvania reporting uh, was about Penn Live. Sean, uh, break the news for us. Penn Live has introduced a $15 a month paywall. Dun, dun, dun. Man, there's got to be people like scrambling to get to that. Oh yeah, there, there, there's a line forming. It's it's it, it's like it's going out and around. It's almost like on I eighty one. Yeah, to get that, um, you know. I hear for every subscription, they also give you a coupon for pumpkin beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might start doing that because they dropped down to like first month at five dollars. <throat> now the first month is down to like one dollar, and one. no one's no one's paying. No one's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how how long this like lasts because uh, I mean, yes, I think paywalls are the future, but um, you know, like a lot of people have been talking about this on Twitter, but the, the paywall from Penn Live is just an absolute joke. They don't produce their own content. Most of those stories are are aggregated from within their advanced media network, uh, which are like the Lehigh Valley Live, Cleveland dot com, like sister websites, mm-hmm. and then. Um, or it's just stuff taken off the AP wire. Like, why pay for that uh, when you're producing very little content? Yeah. Uh, like, and the content that you're producing is clickbait bullshit that's been for, like, the past. Yeah, so. Yep. Pretty crazy. Well, there you go. Pen Live paywall. We'll see. You know, it, it does – it is – it is a problem, you know, as have, you know, so on the one hand, it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, if you're producing a ton of your own common, uh, uh, content and kind of doing a, a ton of investigative work and things like this, you can see where that would be kind of important. Um, I also know the um, the Pennsylvania Capital Star, right, also put out a call this week for um, um, for members, right? They're starting a membership program there, Pennsylvania Capital Star, for um, basically support the nonprofit um, nonprofit model um, to support the reporting we're doing, and you know I got to say you know if you look at the um, you look at the two comparison I mean I really like a lot of the work that's coming out of the um, the Capital Star so I think Mysick probably took a lot of viewership with him to uh, the Capital Star yeah I think that's Penn right <clears throat> I think that's right and you know again it's like you know we we kind of kid Mysick like I'm you know here like uh, kind of frequently and. Um, 
But, you know, I think that, you know, he's been keeping up with his kind of morning coffee, and sometimes it still turns my stomach to kind of listen to some of the kind of like, you know, <laughs> stuff. But, um, but it's still there. Um, and uh, some of the reporting has just been has been really good, and they're following news in a way that um, that that is a good thing. And I think, look, this just may be, uh, you know, this is one of the competing models for um, journalism right now, but uh, the nonprofit model, uh, membership model, um, or you got the paywall model. And um, you know, again, we don't know where it's, all stuff is going to settle out. Um, but you know, this is why you know we bug you all the time. I mean, our model. Um, for what little we're able to do, right, um, is basically to say, look, we don't want advertisers to determine our content, right? We don't want to have to kind of, um, we want to be able to tell you about what we feel about different political candidates and that kind of stuff. Um, so we, we do, we're not, at this point at least, going in a nonprofit model. Uh, what we depend upon is we depend on members, right? We depend on members like you, right? Um, come, going, becoming members of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month, right? And that is really what's enabled us to begin to pay our members. Um, you know, I told Sean this last week, we had to, um, a couple of years ago, we had to upgrade our um, our server space, especially with security, because we had been hacked a few times, uh, especially after Sean had reported on uh, Trump Jr. going to Yingling. Uh, we got, like, slammed by some hackers at that point. Um, so we had to upgrade stuff, and it's and it's a hefty bill, right? I mean, it's well over $1,000 a year for, um, for uh, the security and the space that we need in order to do this. So um, that's because members like you have been have stepped up and become um, a member of Raging Chicken Press. So if you can, if you are not a member of Raging Chicken Press, um, you know you're always welcome here. We don't have a paywall, um, but we ask you to step up and be part of creating progressive media that is supported by the progressive community, right? That is a focus on the movement, right? The what's happening here locally, what's happening here regionally, what's happening nationally too as well. Um, but it's homegrown progressive media. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash RC Press today. We'll be back right after this quick break with today's, oh, I don't know, what do we call it? We call it the Today's Last Call. <laughs> This is Kev Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. For the past seven years, Raging Chicken Press has brought pull-no-punches, progressive reporting and commentary to the interwebs. Our long-form investigative pieces, stories that no access journalist wants to touch, or rollicking weekly podcasts strive to advance progressive movements and perspectives rooted in the struggles happening across the country or down the street. We've broken national stories and caused our share of discomfort in the halls of power. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. And you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as $5 a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. We need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way you can do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken today by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Thank you for your energy, your encouragement, and your support. Keep up the fight. Back to Raging Chickens Out the Coop podcast. It's today's last call. Yes, today we talk space news and beer and all sorts of fun stuff. Usually today is our last call or our, our last call segment each week. Uh, I've just got one bit of space news today, which I talked about kind of in the intro. Uh, very cool. A group of uh, undergraduate students at Drake University in Iowa are developing a magnetic shield to defend interplanetary astronauts from the intense cosmic radiation between Earth and Mars. It's really freaking cool because if you look at, um, say, uh, what is one of the things that enables um, life to exist on the planet Earth in the way that it does, right? is because of the earth uh, the earth's magnetosphere right because that we the earth produces a magnetic field that it actually a lot of the particles that are coming off the sun right um, are deflected away from the earth so we're not bombarded with photons and all the stuff like as, as other planets are 
Mars, on the other hand, um, has a, a much thinner atmosphere, obviously, right, um, and does not have a magnetosphere. Um, it does get a ton of solar radiation, cosmic radiation, um, bombarding the planet. And all astronauts, when they're kind of outside the, um, um, the, uh, the Earth's magnetosphere, right, are always constantly getting bombarded uh, with cosmic radiation. That's even exacerbated if you're talking about um, long-term trips between um, the Earth and Mars, right? To some degree, when you're talking about um, people who are on the International Space Station and that are are, are kind of on the orbiting the Earth, um, they're still within the magnetosphere um, for the most part. Um, but once you start talking about exploring and kind of setting up a lunar base, right, and the Moon, and then you start talking about the Mar about Mars and long and kind of longer space travel, you need to be able to way of dealing with this. Now, of course, that um, sci-fi buffs like me, um, when you, especially kind of Star Trek, uh, shields up is one of the things that you kind of know, and any kind of uh, uh, a spaceship worth its name um, and our show is always has some sort of shielding um, that prevents either laser fire from other place or it's just a way of kind of protecting um, people from asteroids whatever it might be and this is a step in that direction so it's pretty cool and the fact that it's undergraduates and that they named it the magneto ionization spacecraft shield for interplanetary tra interplanetary travel and then it's and then its acronym is misfit all the better. Um, it's powered by um, a basically a nuclear reactor inside the uh, small nuclear reactor inside the um, uh, in the spaceship. Um, so we'll kind of we'll see what that happens. But it was a very cool news to, um, to come out this week, and uh, there's a link down there from Live Science if you want to check out more on that. Um, Sean is is as I mentioned here is headed home this weekend. Um, he's got a lot of preparations um, to do because uh, you got to look just right for a special celebration like this, right, Sean? Yes, it is. Forest and Maine's seventh anniversary party uh, this Sunday. Looking forward to it. <clears throat> you know what's uh, um, pretty remarkable? I also have to go home. Uh, I'm visiting uh, tomorrow and then uh, visiting family uh, down in South Philly tomorrow. And then the party's on Sunday. So I have to leave this afternoon. I don't feel like leaving tomorrow morning and running around for four hours. Yeah, I mean, Sean said something. He's got to get. He's, I, I don't know. I guess yeah, there's a special, you know, cool Philly dress code that he's got to. He's got to yeah. get pick up yeah. some extra pieces for. So make sure that he's like he's doing it right there and there, <laughs> down in Ambler. Uh, no, but what I was realizing, Sean, is that uh, you know, seventh year anniversary is like uh, Force of Main launched right uh, in the first year of our podcast. If you remember, so oh, the website. Been, I'm sorry. First year of the website, yeah. So we were actually doing the, uh, yeah, my bad. Uh, we were doing uh, been doing raging chicken for uh, almost a year when Forest of Maine first launched. I remember talking to you about it, um, kind of way back then. So it was very, very cool. Very yes. Cool. And uh, yep. So, so I that that go ahead, I'll sorry. be looking forward to that. Um, that will be like a nice big bottle share type thing where people will be bringing bottles from all around, to drink and have fun with. So yeah, you still got and you still got some some friends who are going to show up down there too as well, right? If you're gonna. Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be cool. nice. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Um, the uh, one kind of cool bit of news, and you know, if anybody's been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know that Sean is not a fan of pumpkin beer. He thinks it's like basically a disgrace to any like the whole beardom, right? <laughs> well, the uh, chickens are coming home to roost uh, when it comes to pumpkin beer. Weyerbacher, um this week. Basically, uh, they sold 55% of the majority stake uh, to a private investment firm, and they filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, and they say that the reason is pumpkin beer. Uh, yeah, it was actually because I tweeted this out earlier, and um, one of my friends said, uh, actually, pumpkin beer is not the reason why they struggled. Uh, it was stealing bad investments and terrible management. Uh, that seems to have brought down the company. Yes, I think that's uh, – and it's a shame because Weyerbacher has been around for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think they'll still be around. There's definitely going to be a thing for them, but it seems like they uh, decided to go ha all ham hog with the fucking pumpkin beers. Well, I mean, this goes to the same thing. I mean, you t I mean, this is also ultimately about management. It's not actually about pumpkin beer. It's about the way you read what's going on. Cause like, so, just, so, for example, let me just give you an example. This is from um, this is from a, a place called Vine Pear. 
um, there's uh, an article on this, and let me just give you the give the breakdown. They say they say um, th- that pumpkin beer is a problem. It's a quote: "We were expecting to see double digit growth for a number of years, and with the market saturation that happened in pumpkin and all those other things, that just didn't pan out." Joe Lampy, current president and former COO, told Brewbound. Weyerbacher has been in operation for 24 years. Pumpkin beer's popularity was a disappointment for many reasons, but you can't blame bankruptcy on a gourd. And then they go into the rest of the article, which gets into the fact that, yeah, I was actually bigger than that. Um, so the fact that they were blaming it on pumpkin beer, that it's really about saying they were putting all their eggs in the, in the pumpkin beer basket and thought that they were going to ride that out. But once basically everyone has pumpkin beer, then it doesn't really work for you. But. Oh, and also, like, I mean... Um... <clears throat> I also feel like their packaging is old. Like, I mean, it's time to update their branding. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these people are brewers who run these businesses until they started. They're not, these aren't, these people aren't like marketing geniuses. And it just, it also seems like um, them stouts. I mean, if they just update their packaging and make it look like it's in 2019 instead of like, you know, 1995 when the brewery first opened, like, I feel like a lot of that stuff. Um, is also part of it too, on the management end of things. Yeah, like you have to keep you have to the brand update and going. Well, you do, and I think that you know. I mean, again, we see we see different models of this too as well. And frankly, you know, I hate to you know sound like an ideologue or something like this, but I mean, part of it is the problem of the logic of capitalism. Right? I mean, it's like. <laughs> it's about this idea of, let's say, the constant growth, and you're always kind of growth as opposed to really thinking about establishing yourself as an institution. And, you know, when we've seen um, some, I mean, we're not, I mean, I don't want to overstate the case here, but when you see some um, breweries going in the direction of becoming, say, worker owned cooperatives, right, really thinking about it as establishing as a community institution as opposed to constantly thinking about growth, right? Um, because the logic of capitalism is growth to the point where there's going to like dis- like collapse and destruction and then kind of consolidation and growth. I mean that, that's what that's what capitalism blue does. Bust. What's that? The blue bust. Yeah, but I think it's like, you know, this is the kind of thing where, you know, I would love to see uh uh, more and more breweries get kind of politically woke to this, right? And kind of uh, establishing, you know, themselves I mean, like, as doing things. I, mean, I sort of like Pizza Boy's uh, position with this. I mean, they're not like woke in any way uh, possible. It's true. <laughs> but like, I mean, but I mean, like, they don't want to expand outside Pennsylvania. Like, they might go down to Baltimore a couple times. I don't like they just went to Pittsburgh, but like, I think like he wants to just strictly keep the brand itself a Pennsylvania thing. Mm hmm. Which is like what Tired Hands is doing. Now they're becoming more popular. They have their own brand. But, like, I mean, I feel like the model is small batch breweries producing, constantly producing new beers. Yeah. Because you can just got, you, you can get the stickers, one off labels created, like, one time and slap them on the can. And then, like, you're constantly, you're, you're not being stagnant with the same eight or nine beers in your portfolio. Right. And that's all people know. Well, and th- this is one thing I really like about what what Free Will has done, right? I mean, they've got they opened one other tap room. I guess there's going to be another one that's going to open up on Saturday, in which we reported on at one point. And it's like you know, I literally, literally, I mean, one thing about this show each week, right? You know, I'm always talking about what's the new release, and that's kind of what they're doing. And you know, and there's some of them, and you'll even hear how they talk about some of them. Some of them that they acknowledge, they're like, oh, so they didn't come out exactly what they want, and they'll try new things, and that's what makes it a dynamic space, right? And so if you actually go to the brewery, right? Um, that they now they have lights outside and they kind of got cool places to sit. There's a little courtyard there. Um, um, the second room that they opened up, um, well, I always always forget that Peddler's Village up there is a great space, right? Um, and it's really kind of inviting. So it's the kind of thing that you can go back to and you're kind of, you know, you, you just kind of you get cool stuff and it becomes a community gathering point. So I really like that. And yet, you know, they do have some distribution, right? So they got um, some of their beers that are out there and there's some staples that are, you know, are good beers. But it's, what makes it interesting is that that constant kind of like experimentation um, and kind of like engagement with the community. So, you know, that's what I really appreciate about them. And also, if, you, if things go, um, what, what I love what Forrest and Maine did, I don't think we talk about this, but like um, Forrest and Maine was getting a lot of pushback from the community itself uh, when they first opened up seven years ago. And it lasted for a while. Like the, when they tried to open up their new space, the township put in a ridiculous parking occupancy. You, had to, you have to find 300 parking spots 
within a half mile of the brewery, like which just like no other company is has to go through that type of restraint in the city right. when there's a bunch of public parking lots that people can walk to. And and so you want to know what they did? What do they do? They ordered lives, ran for town council, mm-hmm. and some of the friends ran for town council, and they took it over. There you go. And we're like, nope. Now, now we're making this like, but I mean, you also look 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 at, look at what's happening in Ampler. I mean, Ambler was was a place like ten years ago was an absolute dump. Yep. But, I mean, like you didn't. I used to take the train from Ambler to go in high school, my senior year, and like Ambler was just an absolute dump. You did not want to. I mean, but they did a lot of good work with turning it around. Well, do you remember not- what was one? This is one of the things that's really cool about this is that um, one of the one of the key parts of that turnaround was the theater. Okay, yeah. Right? And if you look at the county theater, right, John Toner, and they run that, the people who established the county theater. My wife used to work for the county theater, right? When <laughs> kind of, What's that? Is that a theater or like a production, like an art theater? It's a film, okay. right? And I think they might have another second stage. I think they have two stages there or two two um, auditoriums there. But what what's interesting with the county theater in, in Doylestown, uh, where my wife used to work, um, we're members there too as well. It's like they have, um, they have a nonprofit um, uh, model. Right. And the idea is about celebration of kind of cultural and film and stuff. And they have worked really strongly to kind of anchor um, kind of kind of kind of cultures of communities. And so when they they that's what they started doing, they started buying up these these old theaters that had just been run down and done a thing and then kind of turn them into these community spaces. And you see this kind of development that's happening right around those theaters. Really, it's really remarkable. Like they knocked out the parking spots on the side of the main street. Uh, they made they uh, they they planted trees, you know. The thing is, like basic planning is once you knock out parking spots, going through the main drag, it slows traffic down, it makes it more walkable. Uh, they did it's just basic common sense stuff. And then like uh, Forest and Main opened up seven years, a, a few years later, when I was in college, maybe it's like four or five years after I moved to the area, Forest and Main opens up, and it's. I mean, you see, like, where that has come. Like, the main supermarket that closed down, uh, the local cooperative bought it, and it's now there's a food co-op right there as you're all going through Butler Pike. Um, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's the whole entire, like, there's 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 uh, farmer's markets every Saturday morning. They close off Main Street. I mean, it, it's showing you, like, what a town, a suburban town could become. I mean, because I mean, like, because for me, like, I hate the Philadelphia suburbs. For the most part, it's just like sprawl, and that's it. Like, with no, like, actual town, yeah. existing town. Where like Ambler, Doylestown, you know, communities on the main line, they've 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 kept that, which was really good. Yeah. So pretty cool. So hey, man, have an awesome time at Forest and Main. <laughs> this I summer. will. I'm sure you will. Um, so we'll see. I still have to look at see if I mean I, I have yet to gone there. So. Uh, Whatever, I don't want to get into like like here's my life, but um so all right well, two things then from Free Will this week since I already given the shout out they got a double can release this week this first one is called Satisfying Chaos this is like this has got my mouth watering already it's an Imperial Chocolate Stout I'll give you their description this beer is decadent and with rich notes of chocolate ganache Willy Wonka's Chocolate River before it was touched by human hands and chocolate fondue parties with an underlying raspberry fruit character. 14.1% ABV. It's going to be available in cans and on draft Saturday in both Perkasy and Peddler's Village. Um, and they have an asterisk on this one that says does not contain milk sugar. Just FYI. Um, and then as part of the uh, um, the series of, say, Brewed by the Women of Free Will, uh, as part of the Pink Boot Society of Greater Philadelphia Regional Chapter, as part of their collaboration brew day, we've got the uh, Bold Bubbles. And this is their description. The Brute IPA, brewed with dragon fruit and hopped with 2019 Pink Boot Society Hop Blend, featuring a combination of Sabro, Mosaic, Simcoe, Laurel, and Glacier Hops. The latest exploration into the Brute style. The spear has notes of subtlety of kiwi, melon, and pear with a bone-dry, earthy finish with a high concentration of carbonation. It uh, comes in around uh, 6.2 ABV. Sean, have you had, had um, any of the Brute beers? No. I think it's just a fact. Yeah, it's just. I mean, I think they're just playing around with it, right? They had a they had one that was because uh, you know you have brute like that champagne stuff, right? And I don't know what it covers, but it does. There is something to that the way that it's carbonated. Um, it has a more 
this this is going to sound ridiculous, but it's like almost if there's like a lot of smaller bubbles, <laughs> right? Um, but it's just kind of interesting. I don't know if I I don't know if I'm a huge fan of it at this point, um, but it's just kind of interesting to see to try some new stuff out. So just kind of curious your take on it. Yeah. Well, cool. So hey, man, anything else for the good of the order? Um, Joe Biden was on uh, the View right now. Oh God, I, I guess he. They, I, yeah, so from my understanding, he got like gushing uh, people or not. You tell me. Uh, so Alex Seitzwald, Seitzwald put this these uh, the start up. Uh, Joe Biden on Anita Hill on to the View. I did everything in my power. Quote. Joe Biden said he didn't call Anita Hill earlier because, quote, I did not want to invade her space because he had publicly apologized. And he's an epic passive voice. I'm sorry uh, for the way she got treated. Uh, it's rare to see literal uh, mistakes were made. <clears throat> mistakes were made. <laughs> So he said this. All right. It's rare to see a literal, quote, mistakes were made in the wild days. And yet Joe Biden on Anita Hill, there are a lot of mistakes made across the board. There you go, everybody. Mistakes were made. Mistakes were made. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to see how this plays out. There's going to be a strong push. There's going to be a strong push to kind of like um, get everybody behind uh, Biden. I think the Democratic establishment, and I see a crash coming. <laughs> I so. see a bunch of people like this need to hill stuff, like come out, like you know what I mean. Yep. I yeah. I just don't know how the fuck you can go to it to a fundraiser with him if you're like. Brennan Boyle, Rep. Madeline Dean, Mary Gay Scanlon. Well, that's that blew my mind to see the PA people that went to that freaking fundraiser. Fucking roll over for them, yeah. The Madeline Dean went there. That really pissed me off, <laughs> right? Um, that that Brendan Boyle. I mean, you know, again, I think Brent, uh, Joe Biden is in the kind of Brendan Boyle kind of like uh, uh, lane. Um, but at the same time, he's, he's been doing things that have been more progressive for that. To just to step in behind this, and then all, you know, all, all it's, it's like watch all the old school all rally around again. The fact that Ed Rendell is out there, kind of like you know, beating the bushes once again with his like kind of crap, is just like it's just, it's freaking disgusting. But yeah, whatever. and it's all the same like mediocre. Yeah, I'm. I'll say more off the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just, uh, I was really disappointed. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of Madeline Dean. I was, I was disappointed to see her. Um, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's just disappointing seeing people just roll over for Biden, like unequivocally just roll over yep. for him without even his campaign like launching. And it, I mean, it's already, it's just crashing if it's not sputtering. It's like you're, you're taking off and a tire just blew out on the like the runway. Yeah, I think it's a huge mistake. Like you know what I mean? Like it's. Especially the show. Look, like it's just it's it's bouncing but, down the runway. But I'm looking at it like this too, Sean. It's like even the fact that look, if, if these people are big fans of Biden or whatever like this, I'm going to disagree with that. That, but to 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 be there for a launch at the chief lobbyist house of of, of the Comcast. MC. That's so messed up. I mean, I'm Here's sorry. The where, yeah. That is such a wrong, a faulty, and like disastrous political and calculation. And also like pushed uh, back lawsuits against the Philadelphia Work Week, trying to get that overturned in court. Yeah, like and with something like unions invested a lot of time, and energy, in, and it's just like. Yeah, look, yeah. I mean, and people don't already, and people do not have a warm, fuzzy feeling about their cable company to begin with. Right? <laughs> so let's, I mean, come on, this is who you're going to put, uh, whatever, but. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be plenty more on this front in the days ahead, everybody. So, uh, hey, thanks for sticking with us. And, Sean, uh, uh, best of travels to you. I hope you don't get caught in too many big uh, thunderstorms. Um, um, it's a good thing that, um, you know, your car is a little bit more aerodynamic now without a bumper. So uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, but we'll have it. So have a good time at Forest in Maine. And, everybody, uh, have yourself an awesome weekend. Uh, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Um, it's been a good one, everybody. We'll talk to you again next week. See ya! And do you feel like disru- disruption has to be part of it? It can't be a kind of... That's, that's the way it's going to make change. I mean, there are many, many methods you can use to, to make your voice heard and take a stand in this. But 
disruption is a very symbolic thing, and it's. I think the school strikes are mostly symbolic because I mean one day a week you can catch up with, so it's not affecting that much. But it's mostly like it's symbolic that we say, why should we study for a future that is being taken away from us? Why should we bother to learn facts when facts obviously don't matter in this society? I think it's mostly symbolic, but of course it's it's it feels like it's empowering. Empowering to know that I'm doing something, I'm taking a stand, I'm disrupting, and I'm. I'm.